It's more than just another radio show. It's a beacon of truth. Fasten your seatbelt and find out why they call Deacon Harold Burke Sivers the dynamic deacon. Join Deacon Harold for a fast-paced hour that sheds encouraging light on today's culture. Welcome to Beacon of Truth with your host, Deacon Harold Burke Sivers. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Beacon of Truth. I am your host, Deacon Harold Burke Sivers, and you're listening on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. So great to be with you uh, today. And uh, today's a special day in the life of the church. We're celebrating the Feast of the Transfiguration. And so I, I always love weeks like this because we kind of get a double dose of scripture. Of course, we do our usual Word of God Wednesday, um, uh, which we do you know, just about every single Wednesday on the show here. But then this week, we have uh, an additional Feast of the Transfiguration. So we're going to take a look at uh, I'm going to do a little bit of an exegesis on the transfiguration, what was going on uh, there on Mount Tabor. And then, uh, but I want to spend most of the time talking about how we are transfigured by our encounter with Christ, how our encounter with living God transfigures and transforms us. So that's what we're going to be talking about uh, today on Beacon of Truth. And if you want to join us today, we'd love to hear from you. Send us an email, Beacon at EWTN.com. And every once in a while, it's a good reminder uh, to tell you what what we're trying to accomplish here with the show. You know, the purpose of Beacon of Truth is to help bring people to a deeper love and intimacy of Jesus Christ and the Catholic faith by doing one thing very well, speaking the truth of the faith and love. As Paul and in, in, uh, encourages us to do in Ephesians 4.15. And we know that truth is not an idea, is not a social construct, is not a philosophy. Truth ultimately is a person, the person of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who in John 14.6 says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Not a truth, the truth. Right? It's the truth that sets us free to become the person who God created us to be. And so when we talk about different topics here on the show, we're trying to plug in different aspects of our everyday lived experience and connect that more deeply with our relationship with Christ so that we see everything that we do as an, as an outcropping, as an extension of our relationship with Christ um, so that there's nothing that happens in our life that's meaningless, that, uh, that we try to find a deeper sense of purpose for our lives, um, so that we try to make sense of uh, the uh, sometimes the insanity and the brokenness uh, and the hurt that we see in the world around us, you know. So that's what we're trying to do here on Beacon of Truth, and I'm so glad that you're uh, you join us every day. This just shows Monday through Friday, and I love that you're joining us as well as, well as our our international audience as well. You know, this uh, show is also aired in England and uh in ireland and the philippines and who else knew who else knows where else well but uh but but love when when you're able to uh to be here with us today and uh what i love about the transfer have you ever been to by the way again let's pray for peace in the holy land that all the hostilities um uh will will subside and that peace the peace of god that is beyond all understanding begins to reign in the hearts of the people of Israel and Palestine, that they 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 truly find the peace of Christ um, to uh, to alleviate the conflict. Um, you know, so if we're when we're finally able to go back to the Holy Land again, uh, you know, one of the, the places that everyone goes, of course, is uh, Mount Tabor, the, the the Mountain of the Transfiguration. And what's interesting is, you you know, the the tour buses can't go up that hill. It's it's a it's a very steep climb. And there's a number of switchbacks, and those roads are quite narrow. So what you have to do, there's a uh, kind of a a bus terminal at the bottom of the hill, and then you transfer from your tour bus to a series of minivans. And then, uh, so obviously, you have to get like six, seven, eight, nine minivans, depending on how many people are part of your pilgrimage. And then those minivans take you up the switchbacks up to the top of uh, of the mountain there. 
Um, and it's be- absolutely beautiful view from up there. You can see why Jesus took uh, the, those wonderful subgroup of apostles, Peter, James, and John, with him up Mount Tabor. He was transfigured before them. And uh, so it's a beautiful place to have a mass, um, you know, and uh, uh, so I really want to encourage you next time you're able to go and, f- and find time when you're there to pray. That's one of the things about these holy sites is that we need to, to, to have time to pray, not just go there and take pictures and back on the bus again, but really find time to, to spend before the Lord, to open our hearts to him um, in these places where, uh, Jesus lived and he and he walked and he taught and he did miracles, you know, um, to, to really experience Christ in a deep personal way so that the readings that we read every week in the scriptures come alive, right? So the scriptures come alive in our hearts. You know, I was also thinking about um, this transfiguration, uh, reflecting back on uh, music week, which we had last week, and how music also transforms us as well. You know how music can be transformative in our lives. We saw that in many different aspects that we talked about uh, last week on, on Music Week. And uh, uh, and of course, Ace had a lot of wonderful things, a lot of wonderful insights, uh, to both of us being musicians, about uh, Music Week. So Ace, uh, how about you help us make a connection here? Um, the, I'd love to hear your, your kind of thoughts on the connection here between um, uh, this transfiguration and music being transformative for us. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, it, it's funny that you mention it from that perspective, because as we were preparing for today's show, that's exactly what I was thinking about is the music that's changed or impacted my own life or, you know, stories that I hear on Sunday mornings as a worship leader where people will say, oh, that song really spoke to me. And the thing that I love is, you know, in in, in the transfiguration, we're supposed to die to self, right? We're supposed to let go of, you know, all the things that we have on our agenda and surrender to God's agenda because it's way better anyway. But until we get to that point, we have to peel back one layer at a time. You know, we, we oftentimes will say, well, I wish I knew then what I know now, but we weren't in a place that we could do that, right? We had to peel back one layer because one was constricting the other. One was, you know, blinding us or, you know, as a lot of times I've heard pastors and priests talk about our blind spots, right? We don't know what we don't know. So what I love about music is when it can be that layer that it's peeled back like, man, that song just broke me or that, you know, that chorus just got stuck in my head and I sang it and, you know, it really spoke to where I'm at right now. And so to me, that's the beautiful thing about music is that it has that ability to, you know, to shed back all of our skin and go, okay, I'm completely exposed. God, use me. Yeah. Cause music really speaks to the depths of, to the, to the soul. Yeah. You know, um, and really speaks to a part of us that was is uh, where God speaks to us. Yeah, you know, there's a there's a place in our hearts that's reserved for God. Um, and even atheists and people who don't believe that that place is, in their heart is still there. Mm-hmm. You, you know, they just they're just not open to allowing God to work within that space. And sometimes music can be that kind of um, wedge, if you will, that yeah. opens up that space enough for God and the Holy Spirit to be able to come in, you know, into, into someone's life. Well, uh, and music is that next music is, could be that nexus, you know? And think about this. Think about when you've discovered an album or an artist and you just latch on, like I know for you, like it's queen for me, Beatles and Zeppelin and that stuff. Like when you latch onto that one album that you listen to it on repeat for like two weeks, yeah, that's yeah. your soul <laughs> attaching itself to what's happening in the music, happening in the lyrics and while, yes, we have to be careful what kinds of bands we're attaching ourselves to, God has a way to speak through to us when we're not in a place where necessarily worship or hymns are necessarily speaking or able to, you know, we're not in a place to receive it, right? He, he knows us. He knows how to get to us and go, okay, we got all these layers off with this stuff. Now I got your attention. Now I'm going to feed you with this stuff. And that's what I love about music and, and what draws us 
together. I mean, like even our friendship is an example of that, of liking the same bands or being influenced by the same albums as players, but also as just fans and lovers of music. And then you start to open up. I've, I know friends that have small groups that they have, it's it's vinyl and, and brews and they're either drinking coffee or beer. And then they're, you know, talking about music and then how it's influenced their faith. And I love that because we get to the pains and the vulnerabilities and all the testimonial things that we're supposed to do to share share how God has worked in our lives. And then that impacts other people. Yeah, exactly. And that's where the transfiguration comes in, Amen. you know, uh, music as a vehicle for transforming us ultimately into a deeper relationship with God. I mean, because music allows you to be introspective, allows you to think about what's going on in your life, about where you've uh, been and uh, where you are now and where you're, where you're heading to. Yeah. And I love that. So we're talking about the transfiguration, the feast of the transfiguration today. Would love to hear from you on Beacon of Truth. Send us an email, beacon at EWTN.com. And we'll be back with the Soulful Songs. So, is this is this one of those songs where the the, the, uh, the drummer has a, like a is it someone playing a tambourine? Is the drummer yeah. hitting the so tambourine? So you got tambourine going on. The drummer's okay. doing his thing. Bass is right in there, and they're just. It's when you make that stink face. You look at each other like, yeah, he's got it. <laughs> yeah, I love how the, the guitar and the, the, um, the keyboards are doubling each other. Then see that on yeah. that line, like that. You're finding some good stuff, man, for the music. That's awesome. It's too much fun. It's what I do with my day. What can I say? <laughs> <laughs> you listen to Beacon of Truth. I'm your host, Deacon Harold Burke Sivers, and today is the Feast of the Transfiguration. And we're going to take a look at the Transfiguration. We're going to I'll do, I'll do a little bit of a of a scriptural reflection, and then we're going to talk about how uh, our encounter with Christ truly transfigures and transforms us. To become more and more like Christ. We'd love to hear from you today. Uh, just send us a, an email, beacon at EWTN.com. Of course, this show is brought to you by some amazing people working behind the scenes to bring you Beacon of Truth every day. Matt Kabinsky screening calls and Charles Beery doing social media and the one and only producer, Ace McKay. Well, I know as we talk about transfiguration today, part of that too can tie into the month of August, which is also the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And uh, all you have to do is shop EWTNRC.com to get medals, pendants, got some great artwork, prayer cards, whatever you need to help go even deeper into that devotion. Uh, find out more at EWTNRC.com. All right, when well, we hear that music, you know it is time for the Soulful Psalms. And on this Feast of the Transfiguration, we're looking at Psalm 97. Now remember, this Soulful Psalms segment of Beacon of Truth is now its own podcast. That's right. You can go to Podcast Central at EW10.com and download the Soulful Psalms as a podcast, or you can go to one of your favorite podcast mediums such as uh, Spotify or iTunes or and uh, and listen to it there, SoundCloud, listen to it as a podcast as well. Again, on this Feast of the Transfiguration, we're taking a look at Psalm 97. Psalm 97 is in book four of the Psalms, uh, it, it, which is the shortest book of, of, uh, uh, of, the, of the five books of the Psalms. Um, 90, Psalms 90 to 106. So those 17 Psalms are uh, composed book four. And uh, today we're looking at Psalm 97. Now, many of these Psalms in here don't have any attribution. So in other words, uh, there's not many prescripts in, in these particular sections of Psalms. Well, Psalm, Psalm 90, of course, is uh, by Moses. Well, most of the other Psalms in this section uh, don't have prescripts, which is interesting. Um, Again, okay, but we're also look, we're looking at the Revised Grail Psalms, 
uh, uh, which are used for the holy sacrifice of the mass. And I believe that this psalm is also the one that's used today. Yes, it is. It's the one used today at mass for the Feast of the Transfiguration. So if you are able to get the mass today, this is the psalm, or at least part of the psalm, that you're going to hear today, Psalm 97. Verse 1, the, the Lord is king. Let earth rejoice. Let the many islands be glad. So right there in verse one, the Lord is king, right? Um, so there's so many things that try to uh, be king in our lives, you know, whether that to be money or sex or our jobs or whatever it is. But we have to remember that our relation with Christ and it, 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 it uh, allows us to recognize Christ is truly the king of our lives. He's the king of our hopes and our dreams. Uh, and and of us uh, and of us as well. He's the ruler over our lives, and uh, we, the more we align ourselves with him, the more we place ourselves under his uh, his leadership, uh, the the more we're able to fully become the person he created us to be. And he says, "Let earth rejoice." So uh, everything that God creates rejoices in the Creator by simply being what they were created to be. Cloud and darkness surround him. Justice and right are the foundations of his throne. So some beautiful imagery here, cloud and darkness surround him. So um, uh, so when, when, when Jesus is transfigured, you know, it says that his, his clothes, be, you know, he was like bright as the sun. It's, you know, his face shone like the sun. His clothes became dazzling white, almost like a, a, a prefigurement to the, uh, to the resurrection, you know? Uh, and so justice and right, are the foundations of his throne. Again, not earthly, not, not money, fame, power, authority. Justice and right judgment are the foundations of his throne. You know, so, and because that's the way God rules our lives. He's, he rules, he, he's a servant. Headship, leadership, and authority are rooted in service. And justice and right judgment are the foundations of God's uh, reign in our lives and in our hearts. Verse three, a fire prepares his path. It burns up his foes on every side. His lightnings light up the light up the world. The earth looks on and trembles. So uh, this is so when we look at the transfiguration, the transfiguration is a uh, what's called a theophany or a manifestation of God. Okay, and so here uh, the psalmist is describing uh, the God uh, through his manifestations in nature. You know, so a, f a fire prepares his path. So you think about um, a volcano that erupts and then there's this lava flow and it burns up everything. It literally destroys everything in its path on either side of the lava flow. Everything is completely um, uh, destroyed and annihilated. His lightnings light up the world. The earth looks on and trembles. So God is the ruler over nature. And... Um, his lightnings light up the world. So it's not just the, the lightnings that, you know, cause forest fires and things like that, but his light that lights up our lives, his light that enters into the darkness uh, of our of our lives and, and brings light and hope and peace and joy to those dark places in our life. And the fire of his love burns away all those things that separate us from his love. Right, just like that lava field goes and it eats up all the the trees and everything that's in its path, God's love burns away all those things. When we allow him to, when we give him space in our lives, burns away everything that separates us from, from uh, loving him with our whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. And you know, when you read this, it, the next thunderstorm you sit through will take on a whole new vibe because with every lightning flash, there comes thunder, right? As a kid, you know, you counted one, one thousand, two, one thousand to see how soon the thunder, because you knew how close the storm was, right? But it's a reminder of, you know, when we're surrounded by the storm that God protects us, but it's almost like the earth is worshiping the Lord in those moments. You see the lightning, you hear the thunder, you know, everything shakes and, you know, the dogs are barking and it's crazy, right? And so when you read this, it totally puts into perspective what else is going on supernaturally that we don't even realize that God's getting our attention. 
and then you know lighting up the sky with crazy zigzags of lightning which I, I, I that's just one of the things I, I we have a big window in our living room and I just pull the drapes back and I just sit there my wife's like you know we were watching a movie I'm like after the storm like I gotta watch like there's just something in me that enjoys it <laughs> but when you put it in the context of this verse it makes it even grander because you see all the things that God has created coming together in worship of him because of his amazingness. Yeah. And, and, and there are manifestations of God's power, Yeah, you know, which is what we're talking about today, the transfiguration um, where, where Jesus manifests himself before the wonderful subgroup of apostles as God, you know? Uh, yeah. and so we'll talk a little bit more about that later, but you're exactly right. And in fact, the, the Psalm continues that same theme in verse five. The mountains melt like wax before the face of the Lord, before the face of the Lord of all the earth. The skies proclaim his justice. All people see his glory. So in these different manifestations, as, as Ace was just talking about with the lightning and the thunder, um, you know, God is making his presence known. And that's how nature worships God, by being what he created them to be. And, and so, uh, in a sense, they have it easy, don't they? You know, lightning is manifests and honors God and worships God by not being thunder. Snow manifests the power of God by not being rain. You know, they just it, it, they are what they are were created by God to be. And the same thing is true for us. We allow God's transforming, transfigurative power through the Holy Spirit to work in our lives. Like that's why we have to sacrifice the Eucharist, baptism confirmation, uh, anointing of the sick, holy orders, matrimony, reconciliation. All of those sacraments are called to transform us, to transfigure us, uh, to be more and more like Christ. And then the more we're like Christ, the, the more we're able to more effectively witness that manifestation of God's love to the world. Right? That's what we need to be doing so much better right now in our culture, manifesting uh, the love and the life of Christ to others. Love this. Verse 7. Let those who serve idols be ashamed. Those who boast of their worthless gods. All you angels worship him. I love that. So, uh, so why? So God is manifesting himself um, and, and uh, how nature worships the Lord by being what they were created to be. But yet, we turn to these false idols of the culture, things that we worship, money, you know, uh, material things of this world, uh, you know, uh, uh, we glory in the praise of others. We glory in how big our house is, how much money we have. And ultimately, none of that matters in the end, because ultimately uh, what matters is a deep, intimate, personal relationship with God. But they're worthless, right? These idols are worthless. Why? They're just things. Right? They don't speak to the depths of, of who we are. Zion hears and is glad. The heavenly Jerusalem now, that's the Zion. Zion hears and is glad. The daughters of Judah rejoice because of your judgments, O Lord. So, um, you know, so Judah here, uh, well, so Judah is one of the 12 tribes of Israel, right? Um, and, and so, you know, we had the 10 tribes in the north. We had Judah and Benjamin in the south. And so Judah is glad and rejoice because of the judgments, O Lord. Why? Because, remember, justice and right judgment are the foundations of the throne of God's reign. And so we rejoice because we recognize the power of God working in and through our lives. For you indeed are the Lord, most high above all the earth, exalted far above all gods. So over, over all those false gods of the culture, God is reigning in our lives. The Lord loves those who hate evil. He guards the souls of his faithful. He sets them free from the wicked. Ah, so when we align ourselves with God's will, um, he's able to work powerfully in our lives. Light shines forth for the just one and joy for the upright of heart. Rejoice in the Lord, you just. To the memory of his holiness, give thanks. Yes, we give thanks to the Lord always by the witness of our lives. We're taking a look at the transfiguration today on Beacon of Truth, beacon at EW10.com.
Yeah, I like that. You know, this song kind of reminds me of a, like in a, a soundtrack in a movie. Yeah. Like was making a transition from one scene to another, something like that, or, or maybe the opening credits. You know, it kind of has that kind of vibe uh, yeah. for me. And the thing I love like about that. music, especially when it comes to live music, is when you hear that build up, right? The drummer's just, you know, filling it with subtle toms and it's just a build, build, and you don't know where it's about to explode, but then <laughs> the song just comes out and you're like, yes! And you just, yeah. you're, you're in it, right? Here we go, three minutes, let's hit it, you know? So, exactly, beautiful. Exactly. Awesome. We're listening to Beacon of Truth. I am your host, Deacon Harold Burke Sivers, and you're listening on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. Well, today is the Feast of the Transfiguration, and that's what we're talking about today, how the power of God working in our lives transforms us, transfigures us to become more and more like Christ. We'd love for you to be part of the program today. Send us an email, beacon at EWTN.com. And uh, again, the show is brought to you by some great people who work every day to uh, make sure this everything goes smoothly on Beacon of Truth, Charles Beery, doing social media, Matt Kabinsky screening calls, and our producer extraordinaire, Ace McKay. I don't know if it's smooth. We just keep paddling. That's all we have to do. Um, <laughs> of course, as you get set for any of your questions that you know spark in your own faith, that's what Open Line Wednesday is about, and really Open Line any day. But on Wednesday, you get Father Mitch Pacwa, one of our faves, uh, and definitely a mentor for uh, Deacon Harold. So uh, make sure you check that out. That is going to be going on at uh, tomorrow afternoon, 3 Eastern on EWT and Radio. Have your questions ready to go, and make sure you're a part of the show. All right. Well, today, again, we're looking at the transfiguration. So the first thing I want to do is take a look at the, the scriptural text uh, that we're using for the transfiguration. So today uh, it would be from Mark's gospel, Mark chapter 9. And we'll just take a quick look through at what's going on here. All right. Uh, Mark chapter 9, uh, verses 2 to 10. So it says, Jesus took Peter, James, and his brother John, and led them up a high mountain apart uh, by apart by themselves. All right. So it's very interesting here that Jesus has this wonderful subgroup of apostles. So he has, you know, Jesus is the is God, right? <laughs> and then he has Peter, you know, in Matthew 16, 18, Peter is the head disciple. Uh obviously, after the um when the church starts after the feast of Pentecost, he becomes the first pope but he's uh, the head of the apostles. Then we have a wonderful subgroup of apostles, Peter, James, and John. And so we see this subgroup of apostles in, in certain points in Jesus's uh, ministry. For example, when he raised a 12-year-old girl from the dead, right? He kicked everybody out of the room except for the parents and Peter, James, and John, right? When he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, right? When he was uh, about to undergo his passion, we see that same subgroup of apostles who are with him, Peter, James, and John, right? So uh, where does this come from? Uh, so uh, if you look in the Old Testament, you'll see that there's a kind of a, a structure there um, uh, in the Old Covenant. So, for example, we have uh, Moses, you know, uh, being kind of the leader of the people. Uh, he's kind of the head. And then we have Aaron, uh, who's the who's the high priest. So Moses is, you know, uh, he's in charge. He's the one that God appointed. Then uh, Moses has Aaron as kind of his right hand, you know, kind of the head of all of the, the priests there. And then we have a subgroup, Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, right? Those three. And then he had the 12 men from the different 12 tribes of Israel. And then he also had the 70 elders of Israel. Uh, that he uh, that helped him to manage the different um, uh, cases and things that he was dealing with uh, during the 40-year trek in the desert. So Jesus uses that same model. So instead of Moses, you have Jesus. Instead of uh, Aaron, you have Peter. Instead of Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, you have Peter, James, and John. And then you have the 12 apostles, again, the, the, the fulfillment of the 12 tribes of Israel. And then remember, Jesus sent the 72 out, 
um, to to go out and preach just like the 70 elders. So we see a wonderful parallel parallelism here between the structure of uh, the Israelites in the Old Testament and Jesus establishing the New Testament. Because remember, he's establishing himself as the new Moses. He's leading us out from the darkness of sin into the, the promised land of, of, uh, of heaven, of, of, of being with him forever in heaven. So he's seen, so Jesus is establishing a new covenant. He's the new Moses, the new Exodus, leading us out, out from slavery to sin to the light of truth, the fullness of truth, living with God forever in heaven. So he took them up a high mountain apart by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. So this transfiguration, again, is a theophany, a manifestation of God. Now, now we see other theophanies of God as well. In fact, John Paul, St. John Paul II, in, um, in, in his document, uh, Rosarium Virginae, on the, the Rosary of the Blessed Virgin Mary, uh, incorporated uh, the, uh, the mysteries of light or the luminous mysteries. And all of these luminous, luminous mysteries are manifestations of God. So the baptism at the Jordan, right, for example, when the, when the dove came down upon Jesus, representing the Holy Spirit and the voice of the Father, this is my beloved Son, and whom I am well pleased, listen to him. We have the wedding feast of Cana, where Jesus does his first miracle, turning water into wine, right? And we have um, the proclamation of the kingdom, where Jesus is proclaiming the kingdom of God. Why? Because he is the king of the universe, right? He's proclaiming the kingdom of God as the word of God that became flesh and dwelt among us. Uh, you know, that, that spoken word that became a flesh of the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary that gives life to the world. And then we see in the, um, uh, we also see this manifestation here on the transfiguration, this theophany. And the final one, of course, is the institution of the Eucharist, where he gives himself to us body, blood, soul, and divinity in the most blessed sacrament of the Eucharist. So those are the theophanies and manifestations of God as they were articulated by John Paul II in the Rosary. So we have this transfiguration, again, a pointing toward his resurrection and also showing us that he is God um, and that, that God the Father sent him. It says, clothes became dazzling white as, so, as such as no fuller on earth could bleach them. Again, we have a very, very similar description of Jesus uh, at the resurrection uh, when he was seen his clothes were dazzling white. And which is, by the way, which is why at funerals they cover the casket with a white, uh, with a white um, pall, P A L L. It's called pall, um, uh, because why we're being baptized into into new life with Christ. So we receive a white garment at our baptism when we're babies, right? We receive a white garment, but then also the white garment covers us during the funeral mass as well to remind us that we're not not baptized from life in this world to our new life with God forever, God willing in heaven. And then, then it says, Elijah appeared to them along with Moses and they were conversing with Jesus, right? So you have the law and the prophets, right? So you have Elijah, which is the, the prophets and Moses, which is the law. Um, remember, this is important. Jesus says, I've not come to abolish the law and the prophets, but to fulfill them. So in the persons of Elijah and Moses, we see the physical manifestation of the law. And again, the bridge between the law and the prophets of the Old Testament and how Jesus comes to fulfill them in the New Testament. Then we have Peter, who's probably, all three of them, I'm sure, were completely blown away by what they're seeing. And so Peter speaks up, oh, it's good that we're here. Let's make three tents, one for you, Moses, and Elijah. Now, a couple of things. First of all, it, it says right there in the scriptures, he didn't know what to say. He was so terrified. I just imagine that scene unfolding and, and you're witnessing this going, holy cow, am I dreaming right now? Is this real? He's trying to make sense of what he's seeing and experiencing. So that's, and then the three tenths is just a hospitality thing. He, he, he defaulted to, um, you know, let's make three tenths because again, hospitality is huge in Middle Eastern culture. Um, but what I, but what's interesting to me is how did he know that that was Moses and Elijah? How do you, I mean, there were no photographs. There was no, there was no uh, smartphones. There was no social media. I mean, how did he know 
that those were actually Moses and Elijah, so as opposed to another, uh, two other prophets. Or why why wasn't it, how do you know it wasn't Abraham? How do you know it wasn't David or Solomon? I mean, how did he know it was, it was Moses and Elijah? Uh, so that that's an interesting little little uh, mystery there. Although you know there, there could be that there could be things that they were wearing that or or symbols that they were holding that showed clearly that it was Moses and Elijah. You know that's what I think. I think they probably manifested themselves in a way that it became very apparent from the scripture, the scripture of the scriptures, that it was Moses and Elijah. And they and they recognized that when they saw them. Uh, and then a cloud came, casting a shadow over them, and uh, a, a voice from the cloud came, this is my beloved son, listen to him, right? So almost a similar theophany or manifestation at the baptism of, of the Lord, where the voice of God the Father uh, says, this is my son, listen to him. Suddenly looking around, they were uh, they no longer saw anyone, and Jesus was alone with them, all right? So this, this kind of brief experience of uh, who Christ is. So they got to see this, you know, and, and, and obviously this didn't change anything for them right now in the moment, but these were, you know, after they received the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, these were things that would come back to them. These were things that would, uh, that they would remember that they had these experiences. Um, and when they were leading the church, this was gave them the confidence to be able to follow God um, uh, with, with everything and even given their lives for the Lord. And it says that they were coming down the mountain. He charged them not to relate to anyone what, uh, uh, what they had seen, except when the son of man has risen from the dead. It says, so they kept the things to themselves, what questioning, what, what rising from the dead meant. All right. So we, we still see here that they still have really no idea, uh, of, of, of everything that Jesus was doing and working their lives, which would come to them after they received the Holy Spirit and Pentecost. Well, and how much, too, in the not knowing, was more Holy Spirit kind of, hey, you just know, okay, that's Moses, or that's Jesus, or that's, you know, like, it's, well, yes, there's reputation, but it's not like now where I can send something social media and instantly everyone sees, knows, and hears it. You know, you're talking villages apart, cities apart, you know, so you had to go off of some inkling inside of you to go, okay, Holy Spirit prompting, I know that's who I've been waiting on. Yes, exactly. Exactly right. Um, uh, and, and and that's where the transfiguration comes from, too. We allow God that space to work in our lives. And I remember um, shortly after our twins were born, uh, they're adults now, but when <laughs> When they were born, we had a four-year-old, a two-year-old, and newborn twins. And you know, and I spent one of my many sleepless nights thinking about how my life has changed since the day I met my wife. Now, how I abandoned the thoughts of returning to the Benedictines, how I moved across country from New Jersey to Oregon, basically leaving the only home I'd ever known. Yeah. Um, how entering into a lifelong commitment of loving community and intimacy has changed my relationship with God right? and, and, sure. and not really having an appreciation for how four young children can all at the same time, right. Exhaust me to the point of numbness, right. Made me mad enough to pull out what little hair I have left, which is basically none. <laughs> you know, how these kids make me laugh until I cry and also fill me with so much love and joy that I can barely keep my heart and my chest. Right, so my life has not just changed since the day I met my wife. It's truly been transfigured. Yeah, right? it's been transformed. You know, we've gone from I've gone from living to myself to dying to myself, in loving sacrifice and service to my wife and children in the same way that Christ sacrificed His life for His bride, the church. Well, and I I love that analogy too because as parents, I believe it our relationship and the love from the Lord starts to make more clarity. There is an additional level of that transfiguration in our own walk with God, because if in that instant, from the second that child is born, you have all this love and all this protective, you know, daddy-dum, mommy-dum, you know, over your child, if we have just that much for them, imagine how much more grander his is for us. So again, while 
my agenda is not my child's. That's different than God's agenda. That's the, probably the one thing that is different in how I see it. But also, I want great things for them. So when I give them advice, when I give them encouragement or you know celebrate them, it's so that they have the confidence to do the next thing. Because again, if I want that great thing for them, God is orchestrating that or something grander. So I, I love when that when that happens. So if you're about to be a parent, just be ready because your walk with God is about to oomph because it's going to finally make sense on so many levels when you understand the love of your child and how that relates to his love for us. No, exactly right. Exactly right. And um, I, I think that's a, a wonderful connection between the the uh, parents' love and, and love of God. You know, um, uh, but we have to, you know, and we look at Exodus chapter 20, which has a list of the, the, that's where the commandments are. The fourth commandment, of course, is honor your father and your mother. But that's the only commandment that comes with a promise. Yeah. So, you know, you have like love, Jesus kind of describes this as love God and love your neighbor as yourself, kind of uh, 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 summarizing the Ten Commandments. So love God is one through three. Love your neighbor as yourself is five through ten. Yeah. Fourth commandment is both. Love yeah. God and love your neighbor as yourself, right? Because it's the only one that comes with a promise. You know, it says, honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land which the Lord your God gives you, right? So mm -hmm. there's this promise. So there's something there about that particular commandment, about honoring your father and mother that points to um, our relationship with God as our father mm -hmm. in, in our lives as well. So I love that, love that connection. And it's that relationship that transfigures us, Sure, right? And mm -hmm. and when we enter into that space with God, uh, and we 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 uh, seek transfiguration, it's sometimes scary for people, and they don't want to change. Why? Yeah. Because with transfiguration comes fear and death. Yeah. Right. We fear because in order to be truly transfigured more and more into Christ, we have to abandon those obstacles, those things in our lives to prevent us from loving God alone. And um, and as you said before, Ace, we have it, 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 we have to make ourselves vulnerable before the God who made us. Yeah, and that's scary. Sure, that's well, a scary thing to put yourself out there. And think about this: think about the times when you've been following God and things still feel like they're falling apart. I know for me personally, it's because I didn't surrender everything. I'm still yeah. micromanaging certain things, or I'm still holding on or clinging to old habits or things that are still separating me from him. And so you, you have to get sick and tired of being sick and tired of, I'm following after God, but these things aren't coming together. You have to look at yourself and say, what am I still not surrendering to him? in that transfiguration so that I can know his agenda from my own and I hear his voice louder than anything else in my head. No, exactly right. I mean, uh, I, as, as you were speaking, I was thinking about the struggle that so many people that have addictions, whether it's alcohol, drugs, pornography, whatever that addiction is, you know, the, the, in order to really begin the process of healing, you have to get to a point in that suffering, in that where you where you recognize the only person can help me right now is God. Mm -hmm. You wonder, can I go in and out of rehab? You know, I stop looking at porn for a while, then I get back into it again. <clears throat> Whatever that struggle may be, what is it that keeps you looping back into that cycle again? Why can't you break out of that cycle? And I think it goes back to exactly what you were saying, Ace, that you're not able to surrender everything. You know, it's just like, uh, again, the, uh, I always go back to the um, the prodigal son in the pig pen. It was when he was in the lowest part of his life that he recognized the only one that can help me right now is God. Mm -hmm. And that's the recognition we have to come to. And humility, to recognize only God can help me. This rehab is not going to help me. You know, uh, this um, uh, sexual addiction thing is not going to help me. Uh, you know, but and once it, I mean, don't, I'm not saying those things aren't helpful. They are. But you individually have to come to recognize truly the divine physician is the only one that can heal me, yeah. that can only can touch those those parts of myself that are so dark. That's leading me down this path. So vulnerability in the strength of Christ means we have to empty ourselves 
so that God can fill us. It means exposing the weakest parts of who we are so that God can make us strong. It means becoming blind to the ways of this world so that Christ can lead us, yeah. right? And so we have to give up. But what are we giving up? We're not giving up those best parts of ourselves. We're giving up our pride. We're giving we're, we're giving into the beautiful humility that comes before living before God in a way where we're exposed before him, but not ashamed, right? Genesis chapter two, naked, but not ashamed. We're exposed before God, but we're not ashamed. You know, Christ crucified, he's crucified naked on the cross, but he's not ashamed because he's taking all of our sins upon himself. And it's it's in that it's in that weakness that where his strength comes from, right? Second Corinthians, St. Paul talks about that exact same thing. Right, but the other thing too is that you have to let your pride die because otherwise yeah. the best parts of you haven't even been born yet. Like they're in there and they're just waiting to come to life. But until you let go, it's it's like we talk about this with marriage. You know, you say that when you say I do, I die. I love that because there are times when my wife has an agenda for me to lighten her load. And I already had an agenda in my own head of, no, I just want to sit in my chair with the remote and watch the game. But if she needs me to do something, I'm here to serve her. So I have to let that go and either pause the game or just listen to it in the room or just forget that it's even on because she comes first, right? The game's three hours long. She's my lifetime. Mm -hmm. And so yeah, we have to let go of that pride in order for us to be able to say, okay, I now can be the best version of myself because I am relinquishing all my stuff to God. Yeah, and those best parts of ourselves, like, like you said, are there, and they may have been you know, um, subjugated by uh, things that happen in our lives, a yeah. tragedy, uh, a family tragedy, um, abuse, um, you know, uh, uh, certain traumatic things in our life that kind of overwhelmed us to the point of not of 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 not being able to to really live out and express the deepest parts of who we are. So there, there's healing that comes sure. with transfiguration as well. Yeah. There has to be healing, healing of of things that happen to us, of memories, of hatred, of resentment. All those things have to die. So a lot of things in us have to die in order for God to truly work in our lives, and that's that's hard. It means dying to ourselves so that. So we can rise with Christ. Yeah. You know, be able to say with St. Paul, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So Jesus himself gives us the model. He paves the way of how we are to live uh, this life, this transfiguring life uh, with him. And also one other point, and as an athlete, a former athlete, you can identify with this even as a musician. Like, you don't jump on stage just because you had one lesson. Like, you don't, like, just because now you're on fire for God, you think there's going to be a flood of ministry that you like, yeah, I'm finally going to go do this. No, there's training, and there's healing, and there's all kinds of things that have to be done first before you are ready for what he's taking you to. So, again, allow yourself to be in the pew, allow yourself to be at the altar, Allow yourself to have that transfiguration happening in your life because you cannot run before you learn to walk. Yeah, exactly right. Exactly right. And I, I think um, for us as Catholics, it's and it, it, looking at it from a sacramental perspective, I think the healing comes from the sacrament of sac reconciliation, uh, entering more deeply into the divine mercy, the the, the beautiful um, the image of the sacred heart of Jesus and those rays of of life and of hope coming out from God's heart, uh, and the Eucharist. You know, the Eucharist configures us more perfectly to Christ, where he invites us into this relationship of personal life-giving communion, where his love transfigures us, transforms us from the inside out, yeah. right? Because in that Mass, we experience God's presence and power and purpose. Um, and it, 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 the Eucharist itself signifies and affects communion. Right, it draws us more deeply into the family of God, um, and so uh, we have to be conscious of the fact it's it's cooperating with the grace of the sacraments. We have some of the power to truly be transfigured 
more closely into Christ, right? Because God doesn't force us to love him. If we truly desire to be transfigured by Christ, we have to be receptive and open to his most holy will. Amen. Um, so that, that that's awesome. Wow, man, it's, this show goes by way too fast. <laughs> like we're just We're just starting to have fun. All right, well, tomorrow, of course, is Wednesday. That means it's Word of God Wednesday. We're continuing our discussion of John chapter 6. Uh, we're looking at the uh, the bread of life discourse. We're looking at specific verses, verses 41 to 51. And remember, you can stream today's show by visiting Podcast Central at EWTN.com slash radio. And may Almighty God bless you, keep you, protect you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>